Hello, viewers of the In Time Sanctuary Present Truth Ministry. We surely thank the Lord for this opportunity where we can discuss today one of the most important thing in the Bible. I have entitled my our presentation, The Surest Test in Loving God. What is the surest test of loving God? Because thousands of people who say, I love the Lord. But what does the Bible say? Tells us that how do we know that we love God? Okay? Common misunderstood, but yet most loved text in the Bible. Jesus, before he went to Calvary, he said, If you love me, keep my commandments. It's a very interesting expression because love is a command, right? If you love me, keep my commandments. And so, let us look at the evidence of loving God. Let's read a lot of texts. For example, 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. We love him because he first loves us. Very interesting text. That we need to love one another. Because if we don't love, then we do not know God. Because God is love. So the nature of God, his character, his nature is love. And first, he loves us first. Second John, verse 5. I wrote a new commandment to you that which you have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love, that we walk according to his commandment. Oh, wow. Here is uh, beautiful. The commandment, a new commandment. But he said, it's not new because this is what we have from the beginning. So we love one another and this is love. We walk according to his commandment. Walking according to his commandment. This is the commandment that I ha you have heard from the beginning. You should walk in it. Let's go back to our text. If you love me, keep my commandments. He who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Here is truly what God says. That when we love him, we have to express it in obedience. Obedience to God's commandment by walking, meaning to say, put it into action in a way of life because this is really the walking of God. And so, many are allergic, close quotation mark. Many people really are tired of hearing God's law. So, Keeping the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments means loving God. I will, I will discuss that. For example, Romans 13.10 Love does no harm to neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. What a beautiful expression. Love does not harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Therefore, if it is the fulfillment of the law, therefore, we have to understand and love the commandments of God. Because to love God is a command. I found it so interesting. Matthew 22, 37, where Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So here is a very interesting thing. Loving God is a command. 
But it is a totality. Love God with all. Nothing has been left. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest, greatest commandment. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. That's why Paul says in Romans 13.10 that love is the fulfillment of the law. So here Jesus is directing us to the Ten Commandments. Because the Decalogue, especially commandment 1 to 4, commandments for loving God and commandments number 5 to 10 are for loving our neighbor. So, it is interesting that we need really to love. Because, reason, love, truth, justice, mercy, and righteousness are the foundation of God's government. For example, Psalm 119, 142. It says, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. Your law is true. Psalm 119, 151. You are near, O Lord. All your commandments are truth. So meaning to say, the righteousness of God is that His law is truth. His commandments are truth. Why we don't love His commandment if it is the truth? Meaning to say, if we don't love His commandment, we don't love the truth. So our prayer is like the psalmist. Like Psalm 119, verse 18. Open my eyes that I may see the wonders from your law. The problem is, many of us have our closed our eyes on the commandments of God. So open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Then take action. 119, verse 18. I made haste. I did not delay to keep God's commandment. Finally, commitment, Psalm 119, 44. So I keep your law continually forever and ever. What a beautiful picture of a loving God who commanded us to love his law because his law is truth, commandments are truth, and we see wondrous things of his law. And then in fact, the psalmist, I did not delay. In keeping your commandments, and he made a final commitment. I will keep your law continually forever and ever. Meaning to say, until he die. So, because the law really is the foundation of his government. Psalm 85, 11 says, Mercy and truth have met together, righteousness and peace kiss each other. For the Lord is righteous, he loves righteousness. For the, for the word of the Lord is right and all his work is done in truth. Since the law is truth and the commandments are truth, that is the foundation of God's government. And he is love and that commandment is based on love, based on justice, mercy, and righteousness. But other people cannot reconcile that. How can God be righteous and justice at the same time be merciful? Because he is God. Human cannot do that. Let's look at the, the Bible of the attitude of people who keep God's law. So, what are the attitude of God's people who keep God's law? Psalm 119.97 Oh, I how, how, how I love your law. It is my meditation all day. You through your commandments make me wiser. Wala, wala, wing. Hmm. Okay, let me repeat that. Psalm 119, 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all day. Is that wonderful? You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemy. They are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers for you have given for your testimonies and my meditation. Did you get the point? That the psalmist loved God's law. His meditation all day. And his law make him wiser. And he had more understanding than all his teachers. 
Verse 172, For all your commandments are righteousness. Okay? I long for your salvation, O Lord. Your law is my delight. He loves God's law, the meditation, make him wiser, have more understanding than all his teachers, and he says his commandments are righteousness, and your law is my delight. What a beautiful expression. It's against too many people today who disregard God's law. 119 verse 163. But I love your law. Seven times a day, I praise you because of your righteous judgment. Great peace, those who have loved your law and nothing causes them to stumble. Lord, I hope for your salvation, for I do your commandments. What a beautiful expression. Why people look at so negative on God's law that the biblical writer look at it in a picture that is exciting. Trailing, something to be grabs because the law is what he loves his law. It's a meditation day and night. And those who have God's law have great peace. And it is the hope of those who have salvation. Now, let me discuss. The Ten Commandments have several terms being used. Okay? They are used interchangeably when you read especially the Old Testament. The Ten Commandments are also called testimonies. According to Exodus 25, 16, 34, 29, and 40, verse 20. Or it is called the Decalogue. A Decalogue from a Greek word, deka means ten, and then logos, ten words. Because actually the meaning is the ten words of the covenant. Exodus 34, 28. A translation from the Hebrew expression, Isiret, means ten Hadibarim words. It is also called covenant. Deuteronomy 4, 13. It means to say, it's not a legalistic because it's a covenant. And many people think that when we keep the law, it is a legal wrong. Because it is a covenant of relationship. It is also called Tablets of Covenant, Hebrews 9.4. These ten words are so-called apodictic in form, straightforward command or declaration of basic principle and are broad principle and not narrow, not like the case laws or casuistic laws. The psalmist claims the apodictic principle which he says, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. Psalm 119.6 Casuistic laws are case laws. The application of the principles of the Decalogue. If such thing occur, or if such is to happen, that is, a specific instances or situation. So the Ten Commandments is apodictic, meaning to say a broad law. The application is called casuistic or case-to-case -case basic uh, basis according to instances and situation. Okay, why people try to evade the law? If you, we try to look at the character of God and the character of God's law is the same. For example, God is just. His law is just. God is true. His law is true. God is pure. His law is pure. God is light. His law is a light. God is faithful. His law is faithful. If God is good, the law is good. If God is spiritual, the law is spiritual. If God is holy, the law is holy. And if God is truth, the character of the law is truth. If God is life, so it is law. God is righteous, so it is law. God is perfect, so it is law. So, if God is forever or eternal, so it is law. So, meaning to say, the character or the nature of God is the same with the character and the nature of his law. 
The law of God is the transcript of his character. The law of God, the Ten Commandments, are expressed in two forms, long or short. Okay? Why it is long? Because you read, but you can make it short. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And the second part of the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. So this is the short form. But why is it that Satan hates and attacks God's law? Because it is a transcript of his character, which is the foundation of his government. Then Satan most certainly hates and attacks God's law, for it exposes his character as a liar, as a murderer, questioning God's authority and twisting his word. According to Genesis 3, 4 and 5. No wonder Satan deceives the whole world through his agents, preaching that the law of God is abolished by Jesus. How could Jesus made it null and void when the law is transcript of his character and the character of his father? Meaning to say, many misunderstood the meaning of the law. Those who claim to preach the truth must remember that the Bible is definite that the law of God is truth. So when you preach without the law, it's not the whole truth. Psalm 119, 142. The commandments are truth. Psalm 119, 151. As Jesus and his word are the truth, therefore we have to be careful when we say, uh, that the law of God is abolished. So the question is, why millions of readers of the Bible did not understand the clear and direct words of Jesus when he said, I did not, do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. I tell you, till heaven and earth will pass away. Not one jot or tittle by no means Pass that the law tell all is fulfilled. Did you get the point? Many of us really are thinking, but Jesus says, do not think that I came to destroy. If he did not think, if you are, we are not allowed to think, in thinking alone, how much more of the action of violation? So, again he repeated that word. Heaven and earth, are still here. Why you want to make null and void of God's law? Because Jesus' word, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Just like his law. Okay? Instead, Jesus magnified the law. For example, you have heard it was said of all, Jesus said, you shall not commit adultery. But Jesus said, I say to you, whosoever looks to a woman with lust for her already committed adultery in her heart. And you see, he abolished? No, he magnified rather than abolishing it. Okay, let us look at the Ten Commandments scattered in the New Testament. Because people, when they read the Ten Commandments, they only think of Exodus 20 and go back to Deuteronomy 5. But entire the New Testament, the Ten Commandments are there. But they are not as a whole. Okay, for example, the first commandment. Worship only God. Matthew 4, verse 10. Luke 4, 8. The second commandment, Paul and James confirm. Do not worship idols. Acts 15, 20. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10. The third commandment, Jesus repeatedly said, you shall not use God's name in vain. Matthew 5, 33, 37. The fourth commandment, Jesus set an example of keeping the seventh Sabbath according to Luke 4, 16. As so with the apostles. After Jesus' death, the author of Hebrews confirmed that worshiping on this day continues to be expected of the Christians. Hebrews 4, 9. The fifth commandment, Jesus taught 
the commandment, honor your father and your mother, still apply according to Matthew 15.4. The sixth commandment confirms Jesus' command, do not murder, is still in force, Matthew 19.18. The seventh commandment, Jesus likewise taught the command not to commit adultery, still applies in Matthew 19.18. The eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal, is still there. The ninth commandment, which is prohibition of lying, is still there. The Ten Commandments is presented in Luke 12, 15 and Romans 7 where it says, Jesus and Paul taught that Christian should not do covetousness. Meaning to say, and people say, all the Ten Commandments are already done. How would you demolish this very comprehensive reference in the entire New Testament that the law of God is intact. So you, you have to defend yourself. Okay? And so, here, both the Old and New Testament references, I can give you a lot of texts about the Ten Commandments. Okay? From Exodus and Deuteronomy and go to the New Testament. But we'll not discuss that. So, meaning to say, what are we going to say? Let us look at the illustration. The Ten Commandments is the so-called the vertical relationship and the horizontal relationship. Meaning to say, vertical relationship is that man and God. Horizontal means human to human. So, this is the so-called God vertical love and man horizontal love. So, it's a law of perfect relationship. So, in a short form... You shall love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the short form. We find that. So, it means to say, it's still there. And in fact, it is encapsulated in the word golden rule. Okay? What is a golden rule? Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Matthew 7, 12. So everything to do to others, what you have them to do, this sum up the law and the prophets. Meaning to say, we have to understand that these things really is part of the golden rule. So, let's look at the Ten Commandments. Okay? The problem why many thought that the Ten Commandments is legalistic keeping. Reason. They have forgotten. When they read the Ten Commandments, they immediately go to verse 3. Exodus 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. Yes, that's correct. But you need to look at the preamble. Okay? The preamble, the introduction. The introduction in verse 1 says, And God spoke all these things, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the bondage, house of the bondage. Meaning to say, verses 1 and 2 is an introduction that God saved them first. And after they were say, serve, uh, saved, then they are going to respond. So, verses 3 to 17 is the people's response. You shall have no other gods before me. Okay? So, meaning to say, the Ten Commandments is a response to people who were already saved. The problem today, all throughout the whole world, is we, re we reverse. They reverse it. That you keep the law so that you will be saved. But God's model is save first before keeping. And that is really what is the way how the Ten Commandments is expressed. Okay? So, why God give the Ten Commandments? The two, uh, the almost one or two million people did not ask that. But we need to understand why God gave the Ten Commandments. For me, the Ten Commandments is a gift 
to a newly created nation. They have no identity when they were in Egypt. When God make a covenant, I will be your God, you are my people. And now, the purpose of giving the law is really found in Exodus 20, verses 18 to 21. Okay? What is that? Speak, us, speak to us yourself, we will listen. Do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the God will be with you to keep you from sinning. What's the purpose of God's law? So that you will not be afraid of God, it is a test so that you keep from sinning. So the people remain at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. This is clearly indicates that the people, in fear of God's presence, and asked Moses to mediate the rest of the law, similarly found in Deuteronomy 5, 23 to 32, clarifies the distinction. So, the giving of the law was a gift. And this law was so special because it was deposited in the ark, in the sanctuary. In the heart of the temple is the ark. Inside is the thin words. Thus, it is fair to speak that it's an eternal moral law of God, an expression of God himself. They are part of God's identity a central part of God's self-revelation in his character and his government. Okay, the Ten Commandments is not limited to its application. The Decalogue summarizes the moral character attributes, the, the eternal character of God. The Decalogue is not restricted to geography or history. Whereas, the other laws are intended for Israel and sworn in the land. The Decalogue are not bound by time and space. Therefore, cannot be revised, cannot be relativized to culture. They apply to all nationalities and all time periods. Thus, the foundation of ethical life under God. So, as we look at this understanding... That is, they are really, the laws are more clearly seen as gracious gifts of God tied to the story of his mercy, deliverance. Since the story is a saving and helping story, it is easier to see the law as saving, helping as well. So, let me put a summary a little bit. Exodus 20 verses 1 and 2 is grace, divine action of saving. Exodus 20, verses 3 to 70, is law. It's a human response in keeping because you are saved. This is the order. We call this one the or, or, ordo salutis in Latin. So it means to say that our understanding of this law is a very, very important. Okay, let me now discuss each of these Law. First, you shall have no other gods before me. This law forms the basis of all others. Once it, it is violated, so all others are violated. God demands exclusive relationship with his people. He cannot tolerate rivals to his claims on Israel. They were to worship and obey no one else and recognize God as one who saved them and give them freedom. That's a very important. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, because Egypt has hundreds of gods. But there is only one. So the issue is not theology, but priority. Worship. And allegiance. God is to be the first and above in all everything in life. That is the theology of the first commandment. The law has universal relevance since people have various gods in this world. The life of allegiance is crucial issue to God. Priority of our thoughts and affection, love God with all your heart and soul, mind and strength, Matthew 22, 37 expresses 
the idea that in the priority of our thoughts and affection, our love is God. So, that is, we need to understand. So, the first command forbids giving worship and glory to any other which exclusively due to Him alone. We cannot serve God to masters, according to Jesus, Matthew 6, 24. Anything in life that disrupts the primacy of relationship with God breaks this commandment. The foreign gods are many in our present context. It may be a person, events, job, position, ranks, and things that disrupt the primacy of our relationship with God. So, the first command shows who is to be worshipped and who is not. The second, the third four commandments describe how this God is to be worshipped. So, the second, you shall not make for yourself an idol. Let me repeat. The first command, commandment of the, thing, of, 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 of the Decalogue is who is to be worshipped and who is not. But the second, the third, and the fourth commandments describe how this God is to be worshipped. So, no, you know, make idol for yourself. The principle here is to equate God by making a local God. Meaning to say, when you make an idol for yourself, you are making a local and ordinary God from your own territory. And He is the God of the universe. So, the local God can be captured because they are created by human hands. And meet this God easily in places and things where humans have set them up. Then control these gods and use these gods for human purposes. Did you understand now how deeper is the meaning of the second, of the second commandment? The second commandment prohibits worship of God by images. It reminds people of God that he is transcendent and imminent. Always greater than words a creature can use of him. This law guards the ultimate greatness and the mystery of God. Today, the problem with many people is that they have so many invisible gods in their hearts. Hidden in their hearts. So this law is unequal in strength and in length for the Sabbath. You know, I have studied this thoroughly. Why this law is so long? Like almost similar, 80 to 90 words. Because in the end, God will see it. That in the end time, you have no other gods. And to worship the creator are two competitive principles in the end. He who makes an idol is a sign also that he hate God. Verse 5. And so God visiting iniquity, the inner bent, generational sin, or other called it, up to the third and fourth generation. So the punishment of the third and fourth generation is not granted to human judges, but God. It expresses the fact that covenant violation brings guilt to the entire family. Third, fourth generation is a way to repair all living members of the family, but there is a contrast in loyalty that extends to thousands of generations. So meaning to say, let us not misread that particular law. It's not a genetic sin, but it is called epigenetics. What do you mean by epigenetic? Is this a study how our behavior and environment can cause changes and affect the way our genes work. Unlike genetic changes, epigenetic changes are reversible and do not change our DNA sequence. But they can change how your body reads a DNA sequence. Some call it genetic sins or generational sin. Sins genetically passed. For example, Abraham lied to Jacob. 
And later on, he lied again and his children lied. So, the correct term is epigenetic rather than genetic. Okay, let me discuss again. Why these laws are so long? Just imagine, three verses, the law of worship that is the Sabbath, and the law of the idol, because in the Sabbath, we see the Creator to be worshipped. And here, the idol, which is also the gods of more many people, has that problem. And so, it means to say, it has a proleptic issue in the end. So, it is a global effect today. So, the problem really is, in our world today, there are two competing gods. The gods created by human and the God that has not been created. The true God. That's why these two verses become so close, so long, because God wanted us to understand that in the end, if he is not the God of our lives, we have to worship the God whom our human hands and mind have conceived. So, let's go to the third. The third law enjoins holy and reverent of his name. You shall not use, misuse the name of the Lord your God. God is interested in protecting his name. It prohibits bad language, blasphemy. However, it is a command more grave matter. Use of God's name. His name represents his character. So Israel has a specific problem. It's actually swearing. In business and personal dealing, people swear by some religious name, person, or symbol to convince people of the truth of their words. We find that today. Brand name. So, this brand is already known for its quality and characteristic. And God has to protect his name by reverence. So, what do you mean? Because God's name matters. God cares for his name. It matters to him. And it is so significant because his name, according to Jesus, hallowed be your name. Matthew 6, 9. The psalmist says, Holy and awesome his name. Psalm 111, 9. We should not use God's name carelessly. We should not use God's name uh, in bearing as a Christian because many times his name is used in vain when our words and action and manners or behavior betrayed what we claim in relation to him. We are held guilty in using God's name in vain, according to Exodus 20, verse 6. So, no proper respect, for it expresses reality. Use his name to pretend to serve, to cover up something, to do evil things clothed in the garments of holiness in order to deceive someone. That's how God wants to protect his name. That's why I read that book, All in the Name of the Lord. Meaning to say, the name of the Lord was used for misuse and abuse of his character. God has to protect his name because it represents his character. The fourth commandment is about worship. The fourth command deals with worship, the sacredness of time as separated for God's service. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This is the longest of the Ten Commandments. It's a day set apart to keep it holy, separated for a holy purpose and following the Creator in His intention. God knows race is important, spiritually, physically, emotionally, socially. Anyone who has a heart, this kind need it. It is exclusive, the Lord's day, His day, not ours. That's why people say, no, we can choose which day. Wrong. If it is he is the God of the universe, if he says, this is my day, you keep it holy, do not get what belongs to him. 
This is the mini problem of interpretation. Because they said, I can choose which day. Yes. But God has the highest priority. Meaning to say, you are twisting just like Satan of God's word and order and command to Adam and Eve not to eat. So the Sabbath observance has no parallel in ancient culture. I have read that many books. No parallel. Because it's unique. The Sabbath is a holy time because God is holy. And the Sabbath has no boundary in terms of, see, because time is eternal like God. But the Sabbath is humanitarian and egalitarian in purpose. All Israel, aliens, even animals need rest. All rich and poor get rest since God has no favorite. It is a universal in its relevance whether people acknowledge it or not. But some to say, only minority people. So, in Exodus, we find this commandment and in the second uh, version of the Ten Commandments in the book of Deuteronomy, we find Exodus 20 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy because God rested from his work of creation. In Deuteronomy, observe the Sabbath for it gives Exodus from Egypt a reason for redemption. So, we have to understand it. We keep the Sabbath on two basic reasons. One, God has created us. Second, is that He saved us. So this is it. They are not contradictory. They are complementary or make it solid way to understand our human experience. Human did not create. Neither did accomplish in Exodus. God did it all. We can only respond. So the first, the second, the third, fourth commandment center on our relationship to God. Now let's go to fifth to tenth with our relationship with our fellow human being. The number one is in the side of the Ten Commandments of the Covenant says, Honor your father and your mother so that the days may belong to the lands which the Lord give you. To honor is not only means to have a great admiration of children, but fulfill duties and responsibilities. Honor means more than obedience. It implies respect, care, affection, and esteem. And besides that, to honor our parents is that there is never a time when we stop to be a children of our parents. Because in the Old Testament, once you are not respectful to parents, in fact, you find that in Exodus 21, 15, and 17, strict penalties for flagrant breaking of this law, attacking a mother and mother, or cursing, this is punishable by death. Why? Because we need. And the Bible did not give us the reason whether our parents, how bad they are, how good they are, or who they are, God did not give any condition. So long as they are our father and mother, they are to be honored and to be respected. So, the violation of this command, all evils in the community follow. Why? It's very interesting. Once you don't follow Obey, honor your parents. You don't really respect and honor community. So, meaning to say, in my understanding, as according to what the Bible says, why it is first? First, let me go to the theology. Commandment number four, the Sabbath, there is a creator. Clear? And in the law of human there is appearance is a co-creator of God. Meaning to say, 
This law correlates the fourth as a bridge of divine and human relationship. The fourth and fifth commandments are placed side by side, emphasizing that God is the creator of humans and parents are cro- procreator, co-creator as agents of procreation. Therefore, be given exclusive highest dignity and honor. Thus, the character of God is marred by dishonoring parents, his co-creator. When parents are dishonored, the result will be manifested not honoring others in society. So when you don't honor your parents, meaning to say, that's why you commit murder, stealing, cabiting, lying, covetousness, and all vices and all crimes are sure consequences because, although there are some exceptions, but this is really the result. That's why God placed that. First, in the human relationship. I remember, really, when I was young, those generations, when I meet my teacher seven times, I say seven times good morning or good evening. We are not tired. A sign of respect, but today, you bump, you hit each other, you just sometimes you say sorry. Why? Because it is not practice in the home. We have to honor our parents because they are co-creator of God. That's why the Sabbath, we will worship God who created the heavens and the earth because He is the creator. And now, he is, there is a procreator because this, they are God agents. So we need to understand that. We don't exist in the world without our parents. We don't exist. So that's why since we borrowed our life from them, we derive our life from them as the pro co-creator of God, then it means to say we give due honor, respect, and everything that is good for them regardless of who they are, whether they are notorious parents. So we need to understand that. We need to emphasize that. Because when we violate this first law, we violate everything about human relationship. This is a very important thing to understand. So honoring parents have no condition. God promises long life. Those who honor parents, regardless who are the parents, no condition are stated because no matter what are our experiences in life with our parents, we would never exist without them. We owe our existence to our Creator who provide us with a co-creators. So, the command, let your father and mother be glad and let them who bore with you rejoice. Proverbs 32, 5. That's our role. Children, Listen. Let your father and mother be glad. Many mother and father died because children give much problem to their parents. We have to the society because people keep on saying there is no law. Then commandments is abrogated. Look what happened to our society today. Many parents really died earlier because children are not honoring parents, especially in the Lord. That's what the Bible says. Paul says, children, honor your parents in the Lord. This is the greatest role of parents to their children that affects society on earth and a kind of citizen in heaven, what the children now are doing. Let's go to the sixth law. The correct translation should be, thou shall not murder. But anyway, Most people say, thou shall not kill. This law prohibits to take other person's life for personal and selfish gain. This principle requires all lawful endeavors to preserve our own life and the lives of others. It affirms the principle of the right to live. Man is created in the image of God, therefore sacred. The sacredness of the person's life is protected and God's character as a God's reflection of God's character as a life giver. So, meaning to say, 
you shall not murder. Violence against another person out of hatred, malice, deceit, or desire for position is forbidden. Nothing destroy in the community that God created more than violence against one another. The first several law that deals with relationship among equals. Parents are special, deserve honor. Other humans deserve right to exist near us with no violence or death in our hands. Protection of the secretness of life in a community is in absolute importance. We mar God's character as a giver of life that is sacred if this law is violated. Let's go to the seventh. Thou shall not commit adultery. In the ancient Near East and in the Old Testament, adultery was called the great sin. The penalty for this great sin is death by stoning. Deuteronomy 22, 24. Just like children who disobey, who attack parents. Not only by stoning, Leviticus 20, 14 says, they will be burned. Adultery was not only a breach of human trust that disrupt family, but was also considered a direct sin against God. Fornication is a different category. So, why is this? You shall not commit adultery because God is pure, sanctified, and faithful. Meaning to say, the couple should remain faithful to each other because the faithfulness of the husband is showing the faithfulness and relationship with one God. It enjoins protection of our own and the neighbor chastity in heart, in speech, and in behavior. This law reflects God's character purity, faithfulness of sacred thoughts and hearts, avoiding the sins of the eyes to the mind. Do you remember what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 2, 3? That the one who looks to a woman with lustful in his heart, he committed sin in his mind. So we need to guard the purity of our thoughts, the sanctity of this marriage and faithfulness because it reflects God's character. Let's go to the eight. The eight, thou shall not steal. Just imagine two million people, if God would not give the gifts of law, how do you like a disorder that no parents are on or stealing is going on, killing is going on, committing other things? Did you understand now the context? Which is we need in our society. Remember two million people packed in a tent city with a lot of stealing going on? Nothing is more disrupted of life such as close quarters as thievery. Life in a community demands that stealing demand. As with other commandments, stealing is sin against humanity, but also sin against God. Covenant keepers must not take the property of others. Why we need to understand? Because God establishes a principle with a covenant concerning position and property. It requires a defense of all lawful things that further the wealth and outward states of ourselves and others. Stealing is against humanity and against God. In the Hebrew mind, property was not so much on person's wealth. It was an extension of the person. Many scholars hold that the specific trust of this law had to do with stealing people or kidnapping. However, the principle that law applied to any kind of theft. So, what do we mean? So, we understand to be a victim of thievery was more losing than a position. It, is, it was a violation of self. Stealing was a personal affront. Stealing includes stealing people, kidnapping, to make them slave at the time, which was punishable by death. Exodus 21, 16. Not only money, property, reputation, tax evasion, malicious intent, dignity, overtime work, yet underpaid workers. 
You can even steal the glory, the glory of God and others and accomplishment. So if we violate this law, God's character as a giver and provider to all should be cared for and protected. This is a huge coverage in the Christian life, not only the Christian but all. Let's go to the ninth. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. This command is judicial. It protects the integrity of the court legal system. To give a false testimony is to lie in court to harm fellow citizens. Due process is observed. At least two witnesses according to Numbers 35.30. A lying witness would destroy the process. Guilty people could be free, and innocent people could be condemned. So the penalty for false accusation were severe, according to Deuteronomy 19, 16 to 21. So, why is it? Because God establishes a principle of truthfulness. It requires maintaining, promoting truth between interpersonal relations of community of God. To lie or to, to give false testimony is to harm other people. It includes something vain, worthless, or empty. Inconclusive, misleading, meaningless testimony is referred to as well as a false testimony like gossip. And so, there are many forms of lying. Misleading. Slander, idle talks, lie to deceive, or meaningless testimony is thus referred to this as false testimony. So we need to understand the cohesive neighbor community is based on legal system of integrity. God has been truthful with us and he demands that we be truthful to each other. This is a part of covenant that reflects his character. The ten says, thou shall not covet. But this is not like the law, thou shall not covet adultery. This law is the most unique because it deals of an inner attitude rather than the actual act. In a very real way, it serves as a summary of the Ten Commandments because Kabmitosness can lead us to break all the nine commandments. So we have to understand. The tenth law is curious in its initial context. Why? It prohibits coveting, desiring a person or a thing belonging to a neighbor. This precept enjoins contentment. It also forbids discontent and envy. The first nine commandments are prohibited action. They are liable for prosecution. The ten prohibits desire, which is not possible for prosecution. If committing other wife is an action, then already covered in the seventh command. If committing neighbor's property is an action, it's forbidden against stealing. To commit means to want something you have right to. It signifies one thing with a mindset that is harmful. So, what do you mean by kabet? This is the root of all sin. Self-centeredness, pride, getting something out of nothing. This is the sin of Satan. I want to be a God and all these things according to Isaiah chapter 12 verses 14, 12 to 14 and Ezekiel 28, 11. He wanted to be a God. He wanted God's power and might but not his character. That's part of committing. To commit means to want something you have no right to. It is a mindset that is so harmful. The one committing yearns for, longs for, lusts over which is not rightfully his or hers. This need not mean simply desiring position or family of another. It can also refer to committing religion, religious experience of another. 
which could lead to idolatry and the breaking of the first four commandments as well as relating to human relationship. So, the evidence and the surest words that we love God, we find that. The first nine commandments, God clearly cares about right action. Commandment makes it clear that he cares about right attitude and thought as well. The breaking of God's true inner attitude commandment is a sin against him and can easily lead to the breaking of any or all other nine. So Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandment. And I was so delighted because when you find this expression, if you love me, keep my commandment, it is really fine in the heart of the book of the law in Exodus 20, verse 6 says, those who love me and keep my commandments. So likely Jesus borrowed this expression from the Ten Commandments. Because the word is, you hate God. But those who love me and keep my commandments for a thousand generations. So if you love me, keep my commandments, is the heart taken from the Ten Commandments. Here are the patience of the sins. Here are those who the commandments keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12. Blessed are those who do his commandment that they have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gate of the holy city. Did you understand that? That those who keep God's commandment has the right to enter the gates of the holy city. What a blessing. John 14, 21. He who has my commandments keeps them is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. 23. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him. John 15, 10. If you keep my commandments, you abide in my love. Just I have kept my father's commandment and I abide in his love. Meaning to say, if we keep his commandment, we stay in the love of God, the love of the father. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man. You are my friends if you do whatever I commanded you. So, my friend, I want to make an end. We find that the Ten Commandment is always relevant. They are not obsolete. They are absolute. Remember what James says. To be doers of the word, not hearers only. Because when we are hearers, we deceive ourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, it's like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. Okay? Here is a mirror besides me. So, for he observes himself and goes away and immediately forget what kind of man he was. Oh, there are people who go to the mirror and look at us. Okay. But the Bible did not say that. Because the Ten Commandments is like a mirror. So, verse 25 says, But he looks into a perfect law of liberty and continues in it. Is not forgetful here, but the doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. Meaning to say, the mirror does not cleanse us or offer a solution. Glancing at the mirror does not help. Stay in the mirror long and it gives you an idea where home to get corrected and be cleansed. So, we need to understand. Do you like the mirror? The Ten Commandments? It tells you who you are. It tells us what happened to us. And that's why many people doesn't like this mirror of God's character. But once we stay in the mirror, we find the defect. And the mirror will not give us a solution, but will allow us to think where to find cleansing, correction. And so when we have done that, we can 
Say just like the psalmist, I love your law. They are my delight. They are my meditation day and night. Oh Lord, my God. Let me summarize the Ten Commandments. The principles of the Ten Commandments can never be obsolete. But they are absolute. Number one is loyalty. The second commandment is about commitment. The third commandment is reverence. The fourth commandment is worship. Fifth commandment is to honor. The sixth commandment is the sacredness of life. The seventh is the purity of sanctity of marriage. And then the honesty and integrity by staying and then truthfulness and unselfishness. My brothers and sisters, here is the point. Today, you understand the perspective of the Ten Commandments. It was a gift from God to a newly holy nation created by Him because two million people without His gift of love, there would be a chaos and there would be a big problem. But He gave this gift because it reflects His character how these people should behave. So the surest test and indication that we love God is only one. If you love me, keep my commandment. My friends who are preaching that the law of God is no longer needed, think and repent. It's time to repent because we know in the next episode, we're going to discuss to that. Is Jesus against the law? Are the apostles against the law? We need to correct that kind of concept that is deceiving throughout the whole world. God cannot do away his law because that is the transcript of his character. And since that is a transcript of his character, those who keep it, will one day, by the power and the grace of the Holy Spirit, would transform us, would reflect the same character manifestations to our family, our neighbors, in the workplace. If you love God, keep His commandment. May the Lord bless you and enlighten you when you understand the Ten Commandments. is a commandment of love to God Love to neighbor because the law is the fulfillment of love and love is the fulfillment of the law. God bless us.